Praise the Lord. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. Uh, now you're aware that we're no longer in uh, 337 North Vineyard. We're now worshiping at 95, 92 7th Street in the city of Rancho Cucamonga. That Sunday's at 1 p.m. So there are no more in-person Tuesday Night Bible Studies at this time. Uh, we're meeting this way by streaming. Uh, thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for subscribing to our uh, Shield of Faith media channel on YouTube. Well, God bless you. We're going to study tonight that we are the light of the world. And so enjoy the word of God. Uh, please take note of everything that is shared. Feel free to share it with your friends and loved ones. And do stay tuned at the end of the Bible study. We're going to have some announcements to share with you that are very important. God bless you. All right, well, praise the Lord and good evening, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to the uh, Tuesday evening Bible study for A Shield of Faith. So grateful for all of you. So glad to be with you again. Have an opportunity again to look at the precious word of the Lord. Please remember that you have uh, notes in your uh, email and in your texting uh, system. Uh, so please feel free to get those notes. Get your Bible now, please, saints, and uh, prepare to go with us to the word of the Lord. Uh, I want to thank you for subscribing and sharing. We'll mention that each time uh, our shares are going up and subscriptions are going up very nicely. So thank you. Thank the Lord and thanks to each of you. All right. This evening we're in St. Matthew chapter number uh, five. So please go there to the uh, Sermon on the Mount and let's see what God uh, will say to us on this evening. Uh, Bishop Marty, uh, would you uh, go ahead and give us an opening prayer? Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, with all of our heart, we thank you, we honor you, and we bless you. We thank you, Lord God, for the study of your word. It is so precious and it is so rich. We value your word and we thank you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, after tonight, Lord God, we will feel closer to you and we will feel the urgency to live a life that's pleasing to you, Lord God, that we'll have greater passion and greater desire to complete your will in our life. And we bless you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. The word of the Lord in uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, Bishop Marty, may I ask that we ask you to do the reading for us. Mm -hmm. If you'll start St. Matthew chapter 5 again, please get your Bible. And uh, feel free, if you would, uh, to get on the phone and share, call someone in these uh, minutes or two, and uh, gather others to be with us as we share the word of God on tonight. We're going to read from St. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse number 13, and then down through verse number 16, please. Sure. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden down under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, so we'll stop the reading there, and then I'll ask you, Bishop Marty, would you turn to Philippians uh, chapter number 2. That's going to be our second verse, Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 14. But I'm going to ask you, our notes say 14, would you begin reading at verse number 13, and uh, we're going to put these scriptures together in the course of our study this evening. So, uh, saints of God, it's Philippians chapter number 2. Verses number 13, 14, and 15. For it is God which worketh in you both to, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So this kind of lesson, uh, since I was a small boy in Sunday school, uh, we would enjoy these kinds of lessons. They're called temperance lessons. A temperance lesson is a lesson where we are taught how we should live, how we should behave, the Christian lifestyle. So it isn't a doctrinal lesson. It isn't a biography of scripture. It isn't historical, uh, but it is a lifestyle lesson. How does the Lord want us 
to live. And he tells us what we are. We are the light of the world. Bishop Martin, it's very important that people have a sense of identity. That's one of the things that parents do is that they cause their children to see their lives in proper perspective. When, when uh, you know who you are, it's easier for you to uh, constructively move in the direction that you ought to move. And if we don't let our children know who they are, then it's been said that the gang in the street will let them know or uh, some young boy will let her know who she is or whatever. So identity is very important. This uh, Sermon on the Mount is very familiar and the Lord does many things in it. He covers a lot of territory, but one of the things that he does here, he causes the nation of Israel to know who they are. He isn't speaking here to us as he gives this sermon. He's speaking to national Israel. Only later do we as Gentiles become spiritual Israel. So to the nation of Israel, Bishop Marty, the Lord is speaking and he is telling them who they are. He says, I want you to know your identity. You are light, Israel. You're the light of God in a dark world. And he uses several metaphors we're going to look at this evening. What are they? Well, he says, you're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. You're a candle. And also you're salt. Yeah. So these four specific uh, metaphors the Lord uses to make Israel know. Now, we as a people of God, we are spiritual Israel. And so all of these things that God says to Israel that they are, we now are. We are that. Now, to what extent we function as we ought to is a separate question, but our identity is clear. We are light, we are a city, we are salt, we are a candle. So, Bishop Marty, would you begin to kind of introduce this lesson in context by reading in the notes here? Sure. The Matthew passage is spoken to the Jewish people, although the text is commonly used today to exhort saints in the age of the church. The Lord was specifically teaching the nation that they had been chosen to live as examples to the Gentile nations who knew nothing about God and moral life. Israel was to be a shining light before the Gentile nations. Well, Isaiah, with that, okay. We will not read the scripture. So let's put that in context. Uh, in the world at that time, God had not any people as a nation, and there was no nation that really knew the Lord. Uh, Abraham lived in where? Ur of the Chaldees. And the Lord called him out. He said, your father was a Hittite, your mother's an Amorite. That's what the Lord said about the Jews, referring to Abraham and Sarah. They were pagan people in pagan culture. And the Lord called them out and told Abraham, I'm going to make a mighty nation of you. And your seed, singular seed, is going to bless all the people of the world. Yes. And he called them out. Abraham lived in a tent, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph down in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when they came out of Egypt under Moses, for the first time, God began to show them who they really were. So the Lord took them, Bishop Marty, to uh, Mount Sinai and gave them some entirely novel ideas, 10 commandments yes. that morally segregated them from all the other people in the world. So Isaiah 9 and 2, what did Isaiah say about all of that, Bishop Marty? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Mm -hmm. They that dwell on the land of the shadow of death, upon them both hath the light shined. So the Lord shined light on the nation. He shined moral light. He shined civilization on them. He gave them a concept of culture and decency. He, 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 he introduced an entirely new moral level right. into humanity through the nation of Israel. Mm. So when Jesus comes about uh, 1500 years after Moses, uh, he says to the, to the Jews here on, on the Sermon on the Mount, as he sits there and he begins his ministry, he says to them, I want to start by letting you know, nation, 
that you are designed to shine as a light in the world. That's your national mission, is to shine the light of morality and decency and godliness and spirituality in a world that is completely, well, Isaiah described them as people that walked in darkness. Yeah. The whole world was in moral darkness before God called a people by the name of the Israelites and began to hold them up to show the rest of the world what life really should look like. Mm -hmm. Would you read for us, Bishop Martin, paragraph number two, and feel free to share uh, as we lay context here. In the time of ancient Israel, and even in New Testament times, the Gentiles lived a deplorable lifestyle of moral degradation. Mm -hmm. Children and wives could be sold or killed without recourse or legal censure. Mm -hmm. Sexual immorality was the norm. Pagan sacrifice of infants was common. Mm -hmm. Slaves were property to be killed or tortured with, without impunity. In those times, um, the weak were routinely at the mercy of the powerful right. in the midst of unspeakable degradation. And by the way, in those times, might made right. That's the, that's a phrase that we come in. Whoever has the biggest gun or the biggest muscles oh, wow. can impose their will on anyone around them. That was the culture of the Old Testament. Hmm. Raping and robbing and pillaging and looting was the order of the day. Mm. And in the midst of that kind of subhuman depravity, God shined a moral light on the nation of Israel. Go ahead, Bishop Marty, and read. Uh, in, it was in the midst of unspeakable degradation. The Lord raised up a people by the hand of Moses and gave them a moral a law. A moral law. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Which lifted them to a level never before seen among the human family. All right. Now, Bishop, can you do us a favor and read that important line again? Most because I think the me. saints are beginning to see what Jesus is really saying when he says to them and to us, you're the light of the world. Now, read that line again. What does it say? The Lord mm -hmm. raised up a people by the hand of Moses. Mm -hmm. He actually gave them a whole new identity, yeah. a whole new reference point, a whole new value system. Right. And he gave them a moral law which lifted them to a level never before seen among the human family. So now the word of God told us, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, he said, in the last days, perilous times shall come, dangerous times. And he went on to describe the subhuman men shall be lovers of themselves, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, to be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So Paul described a downward spiral of human behavior and human morality. The closer that we get to the end times, the more degradation becomes widespread and the intensity of immorality is greater and greater the closer we get mm -hmm. to the coming of the Lord. So that Jesus described it and said, as it was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be in the time when the Son of Man comes back. And he, in, in the New Testament, he says, they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. But in Genesis, it says, the earth was what filled with violence and every thought of man was only evil continually. continually. So... There's a downward spiral. There's, there's, a, there's a, you know, we talk about the rise of civilization, but the Word of God makes it clear that in the last days, there's going to be a decline of civilization. So we look at things that are going on in America today, and we step back and we say, how could that happen in a civilized country? Mm. But maybe, Bishop Marty, maybe the, 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 the spiral rather than going up and making progress, maybe human society is, is going down and maybe evil men and seducers really are getting worse and worse. Wow. It's in that kind of thing where God shined the light for the nation of Israel. And I think he wants to use us to shine some light in the present set of circumstances. Yes. Read, read, read some more about what uh, what God wanted to happen. 
Wives and children were to be protected, protected. and cherished. Right. Slaves were to be treated with respect. Right. Honesty was to be the norm, and the weak were to be assisted and not abused. Mm. Israel was designed to serve as a moral light and an example of decency and godliness in a world of universal depravity. Their unique goodness was intended to cause the Gentile nations to be drawn to the holiness and the beauty of Israel's God, who at that time they called Yahweh. Now, you've read, Bishop Marty, the book of Leviticus, and you see the moral on Leviticus. It, it, says, it, it says things that, that God says, don't do this stuff. Don't sleep with your cousin. Uh, men don't have, not have sex with men. Don't do anything with animals. That's sick. All right. Uh, don't hurt your neighbor. Don't steal from one another. Uh, if anyone kills someone, then they have to be killed. Don't practice witchcraft. So God gives all of these moral laws to the nation because he wanted the nation to shine as a light. He, he wanted the other nations around to be able to look at Israel and say, wow, that is some kind of a civilization. Wow. Why are they so much better than we? What is it that they know that we don't know? Mm. What is it that, and, and the sad thing, Bishop Marty, was when the devil persuaded the Jews to want to be like the nations around them. Mm. They said, we don't want to be unique. We want a king. They have, we don't want to be led by God. They That's told right. Samuel, we want, we want a king like everybody else. And, and we don't want to be the only ones that don't uh, have our religion by practicing sex and, and, and having sexual cults. You know, we want to do what they do. We want to worship in depravity. We want to, we want to burn our children to Molech too. Mm. We want to practice witchcraft and, and seek to the dead too. And the nation, because they did not have the Holy Ghost, they were not, they were not excited about being the light. They, they actually, the nation, it's a sad thing to say, people of God, but you know the truth of it. They actually wanted to walk in the darkness of the Gentiles round about them. And God was constantly saying, but I set you apart. I gave you so much. I've made you different. I have a plan for you. I can use you if you'll just behave yourself. I'll bless you if you let me use you. If you'll just do the right thing, look at the good you can accomplish. Yeah. And, and the prophets yeah. came and begged them to walk in the light. But the people chose darkness rather than light, Jesus said, because what? Their deeds are evil. Did not value what they had. So Israel failed God. They, they, they as Bishop Marty would say, they biffed on their assignment. They biffed. <laughs> they did not carry out their assignment. What do I need from you, Israel? I need you to be different from the people around you. I'm getting ready to bring it down to the New Testament in a few minutes. You all know where we're going. I need you to be different. I need you to not be like them. I've given you so much and I'm calling you to something higher. I need you, the young people say, represent. I need you to represent in the world. Represent. <laughs> I need people to be able to look at you and see a whole new ethos, a whole new revelation of the significance of and the dignity of humanity. But the nation uh, in the Old Testament, they failed God. God sent John the Baptist. He said, the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Mm -hmm. If you don't bring forth fruit, you're in trouble. And then Jesus came and he sat on the side of the mountain and he looked at the Jews who were there like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to them, listen, I want you all to know who you are, dear precious ones. You're the light of the world. We got to get this thing together. Let your light actually shine. So do what you're supposed to do. Function the way you're supposed to function. Yeah. So people can see your good works. All right. I think in just a few moments, we're going to take this uh, that Jesus is expressing to the Jews, we're going to bring it down to the Inland Empire in the year 2020. It caused the saints to reflect on the fact that we are called to be the light of the world. Go ahead, Bishop Marty, and, and read some more and help us put this in perspective. As Israel was to be a shining light to mm. the nations, so even more, the Spirit-filled Church of Jesus Christ is designed to be a shining light in our own time and circumstances. So the Lord wants us to be the light now. Oh, yes. And we dare not fail the Lord by walking in the darkness. Right. We are not loyal to the darkness, and we don't want the darkness. What Jesus said to Israel applies even more to us today. To Israel, God said, you only... 
you only have mm. I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Higher standard, higher punishment. And yeah, but, yeah. And, and do you know all the Lord has in the, in the world today is the church? That's all. He didn't he have the Buddhists. He didn't have the, the Muslims. He didn't have the atheists. He doesn't have the skeptics and the agnostics. All he has is that pearl of great price, which is the church. And if we, God forbid, we're not going to, but if we let the Lord down and if we don't shine, there is no light. If our light doesn't shine, what, how, what is going to light this dark world? Wow. Go ahead, woman of God. Amos 3 and 2, that was yes. the scripture that I just read, showed that God has a unique relationship with Israel right. as he does with the church today. Right. Because of the relationship with God, Israel has a special responsibility, and so do we as apostolic believers right. of today. Right. So let me read, as the church, we are the light of the world. Now let's bring it down. The Lord said to Israel on the mountain, uh, he said to the Jews, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to show you your identity. I'm going to show you what I need from you, what you're called to be. He said to them, you're the light of the world. Now, as a church, we're the light of the world. We are also described as a city set on a hill. We're described as salt designed to season our environment. These metaphors of light and salt and an idealized city and a candle show that uh, God's design is for the church to be an example to the unsaved Save. and to make an impact, precious saints of God, on the minds and the lifestyle of people around us who don't know God. We're supposed to amaze our neighbors. Mm -hmm. the, the peace, the joy, what's the fruit of it? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, all this thing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity is not easily provoked. Seeketh not her own, is not, puffed, is not puffed up. Charity believes all things. We should be an example so that when people look at us, they go, wow, why is it that you don't ever act like we do? You don't get angry when we get angry. You don't cuss when we cuss. You don't do road rage. <laughs> All right? You don't steal off of your taxes. You don't leave early from work when you think nobody's looking. All the corrupt things mm. that are so common, why don't you do that stuff? And the scripture says they think it's strange that you don't run with them right. to the same excess of right. They see you behaving differently on purpose and they say, wow, what, what, you must, do you go to church or something? What, what kind of church do you go to? What happened there? Yeah. What's the difference between you and me? I'm a decent person, but, but you take love to a whole different level. You seem to have some strength that I don't have. You bring cookies to the boss when everybody knows the boss hates you. What, what is it about you, Jesus said, that, that you are, you're to make a you our lives, precious saints of God, are designed to have an impact on the unbeliever. And if that doesn't happen, Bishop Marty, I'm failing in my assignment to be light. If people don't see the light of Jesus Christ in a remarkable way that can only be explained by spirituality. They can't just say that Alexander's a, a nice guy. They've got to see a quality of niceness that separates you that from it, everyone else from all the other nice unsaved people yes there has to be a level of love a level of kindness a level of sensitivity a level of sacrifice a level of patience that could only be an indication of the supernatural mm -hmm. presence of god in the life of that person who goes to church all the time and does a lot of clapping your hands and singing hymns but but to what extent is the light actually shining when we go out of the door of the church and into the world that is in absolute darkness and doesn't have a clue what life is supposed to be like. And so we've been chosen for this. The, the notes here that we're reading, you have these notes. It says, although light is the focus of the metaphor in this lesson tonight, we're all aware that salt also, Jesus mentions that, Salt makes an undeniable impact on every environment into which it's added. I can tell instantly if food has been cooked and they forgot to season it. 
I mean, it's perfectly good squash, but you didn't put any salt in it. <laughs> I can't taste the stuff because I'm in my 70s now, and you got to help me out by giving me a little salt. And so salt is supposed to be noticeable. That's the point. You know, the, the seasoning in food ought to be noticeable. And Jesus said that as salt, you are not only a preservative, but you're an atmosphere changer. You're an environment changer. So that, as Bishop Marty, the way she carries herself, men don't curse around her, and they don't, they don't, they don't make uh, um, unclean uh, suggestions and yeah, things. Because there's something about the way that she carries herself that makes it clear. It changes the the, the holiness of the saints, changes the behavior of the unsaved yes. when we do it right has to have an effect, has to have an impact on those around us. Oh, it must have. And if, and if it doesn't do that, then my salt has lost its savor. Mm. My light is going out and my city slid down the hill into the valley and nobody can see anything different. Mm. Now, this is an encouragement to you, saints of God. What we're teaching tonight is not a rebuke because that's not going to get me very far. There is a time for rebuke, but I'm not trying to rebuke God's people. But what we are doing is trying to cause us to reflect a, about a deeper, a deeper manifestation mm -hmm. of the kingdom of God. Oh, the world needs to see the glory of God. Oh, they need to they see need somebody some do it right. They need somebody that's going to be faithful to their yes, wife. Yes, they need yes. somebody that's going to tell the truth, even under pressure. They need to see some young ladies that are not twerking and not showing themselves all over the internet. The world needs to see the light of righteousness. And that's the reminder tonight. Can we teach this, this temperance lesson? Oh, it's so important. All right, let's go ahead. Let's teach this lesson. All right. Jesus said, when salt loses its savor, he said, I throw it away because I don't want it to trick anybody else. Can you imagine? They put a big, big salt shaker on the table, but all the salt is tasteless. So you sprinkle a little and, and it doesn't do any good. So you sprinkle some more. After a while, you take the top off the bottle and pour the salt on it, and it still doesn't change the taste. When the salt is no good, the Lord said, I just take it and I throw it out, throw it out. and, and try to uh, trade it underfoot because it's just, it's a lie. It, it, it seems to have some, some, uh, uh, some tangibility to it, but in reality, it is worthless. So we then must talk about that. This is an exhortation. Bishop Marty, uh, take us further. I think the saints are getting what we're saying. It is the plan of God that the church demonstrate to the world what decency is. All right. We are to be, be thou an example of the believers, as Paul instructed in 1 Timothy 4 and 12. Mm -hmm. We are to make an impact and make a strong impression on those around us. Right. We should educate them, provoke thought, cause them to be envious of us and to be curious about our lifestyle and our value system. Mm. It is mandatory that our lives be noticeable, that we are so different from the unsaved world that we inspire envy and curiosity. We have to be noticeable. We cannot blend in. So Paul writes by the Holy Ghost, be not conformed to the world. Don't blend in. Now, saints of God, that's the tendency that mm -hmm. is so frustrating. The, the, the extent to which people who are in the church can, can want to be like the world. So, so some who name the name of Christ, where God said that the names of Christ depart from iniquity. All right. So some that name the name of Christ want to know worldly music want to dress just like the world, want to wear the same things that the world is wearing, go to the same place, drink the same champagne, sit up, I hope I'm not talking about any of you all watching, sit up in the casino in Las Vegas and gamble right next to the world, have worldly music on their whatever, I don't know, iPod, wherever you Digital keep using. <laughs> Thank you. you. You know, I, I, I mean, I, what I said is out of date, but the principle, uh, sadly, is not out of date. There is a principle of worldliness that the enemy tries to inject among the people of God. We are called to be different. We need to celebrate our difference. Mm -hmm. A person looking at a saved woman should see by her attire that she's not in the world. There should be 
there should be something, the scripture said, make a difference between the clean and the unclean. Carry yourself in a way that you become noticeable. So as saints of God, we're to be noticeably different. We're to not be conformed. We're to find out what the world is doing and make sure we don't do that. And don't do that. Make sure we don't drink what they're drinking. Don't watch what they're watching. Don't say what they're saying. Don't act like they're acting. Don't do their dance. Whatever the world is doing, we're the moment we start doing it, our light is extinguished. Yes. And so Jesus says, let's look at the names. He says, permit your light to shine. Go, go to the text for a moment. I know we're doing a lot of talking here tonight, but look at the text. Jesus says to them in verse number 13, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has no taste, I'm just going to throw it out. And I'm not going to leave it on the table. Verse number 14, you're the light of the world. A city, if, if a city's up on the side of a hill, you can't hide it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, your enemies know where you are. Your friend, everybody can see you because you're up there. Jesus said, I set you. Listen, he said, I call the nation out of, or the counties. I call the nation out of Egypt. I gave you, watch it now. I gave you visibility. I elevated I, you. Yeah, I did that death angel thing. I did a Red Sea thing. Uh, you know, I really made everybody wow. in the Middle East know about you. They know you're my people. Wow. I, I publicized you. I'm your publicist. I set you on the hill, Israel. Everybody knows that you have the name of Jehovah associated with you. And we have to watch it because when we get baptized, we take on the name of Jesus. Now that name is on us. So, so that everyone that names the name of Christ depart, depart from iniquity. iniquity. There's a set of responsibility uh, relative to our behavior once we are publicized as the children of God. Yes, yes. You know, the children of the Alexanders, we want them to behave a certain way because they are, they are known to be Alexanders and we are known to be the people of God. So he says here, uh, a city that's set on a hill, you can't hide it, you're too visible. You wish you could, but you can't. I put you up on the hill. The whole world, the Romans and the Greeks and, and the, everybody knows about you. He says, a man don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. The Lord said, I'm not irrational like that. I didn't associate myself with you and give you all these miracles and have everybody looking at you only to, to then take you and put you up under something so nobody can see you. I made you visible on purpose, Jesus says. He says, therefore, permit your light to shine so people can see how different you are and fall in love with the God who changed your nature. Yeah. That's what Jesus is saying to us today. We must be, the scripture said, come out of her, my people, that you not be consumed with her plagues. So we must be different. It is necessary then uh, we must not lose our tempers. When they get mad, we stay calm. We must not lose our joy. Just, you know, we can't respond to the COVID like the unsaved do. We can't have a mental breakdown and start getting drunk and throw our hands up in despair. We, you know, we, we have to be, we have to be willing to be different. We cannot share the fears of the world. We cannot share their lust. We cannot let ourselves lust after the things that they lust after. We cannot walk in their selfishness or their pride. We cannot be conformed to this world. Satan wants to make the people of God act just like the world because he knows that we are telling people that we represent Jesus Christ, that we have eternal life and we're, and we're different. So he strives to conform us to the world. We must live a life separated from worldly ideas, separate from worldly culture and worldly practices. We're instructed to intentionally make a difference mm. between the clean and the unclean. Mm -hmm. The lifestyles that we live are not only for the purpose of pleasing God and not only to assure that we'll go to heaven, but also so that we can shine in an intentional way. We live holy because we want our neighbors to see us living holy. And that doesn't mean that we're praying like the, the Pharisee making a oh, big fuss. It yeah. doesn't mean that. But it does mean that there's a wonderful saying that you don't pray to be seen, but you should be seen praying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At some time, people ought to detect something different about you. Yes. And that's saints of God. That's what Jesus is saying. All right. So it is necessary that we are intentionally different. 
How what, peculiar people. Uh, thank you. That's what I'm talking about. He said, you are, you, you, you are uh, chose a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And he starts that verse off by saying, what? You are the light of the world. Of the world. Yes. All right. You're a peculiar people, set apart, different. Not odd, Not but odd. distinct. Yes. All right. When saints become no different from the world, their light cannot possibly shine in a significant or an evangelistic way. There is reason for concern that some Christians have become so enticed by the world that they imitate worldly behavior in every way that they can. My, my. The attire, the music, when they get on the line on, on, on their internet, they do the same thing on the internet that the world does. When the Lord said, you're to be light. Sometimes even Christians, and this is a pastoral issue, uh, sometimes, Bishop Marty, people are afraid to dress for church because they want to be like the world. Look at me. I'm dressed for church. You're dressed for church. You look beautiful. You, you, look you, you look like you're dressing to come and honor God on purpose. And I'm not saying that clothes sanctify you. I know that. You can have one of the prettiest tie you know and still be a terrible person. We all understand that. But the point is, when I come to worship God, I, I, want, to, I want to separate myself from the world. And, and I said this because it's come to a time that some Christians are almost afraid to dress like they're going to church. They feel like there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop a sinner from coming off the street and getting saved just because I wear a tie. My tie is not going to make somebody stay on drugs. <laughs> it's all right. To, it's all right to be a light and to be a city sitting on a hill. It's all right to be different. God calls us. If there's any one point that you take out of his lesson tonight. God calls you to be different from the world around you. If you're not willing to be different, you're not willing to bring God glory. Mm. You're light. The Lord has given you your identity. As a child of God, as a son of God, you're light. So, um, uh, I, I, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4, they think you're strange that you don't run with them to the same excess of riot, and they speak evil of you. Speaking. They want to know why you don't cuss and why you don't get drunk and why you know you don't uh, go around work telling everybody how horrible your husband is. Like they're all you know talking about their wife behind their back and they're all tearing down everything and talking about the boss and and all the negative things of the flesh that people do. And then Peter said, "This is Peter. This is the one that had the key of the kingdom." And Peter said, "When you live differently." When your light shines, they don't understand what's wrong with you. Mm. Paul said that, that among whom, among them, you shine. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse number 2. Let me read that scripture, Bishop Murray, that you gave us. He said, he said, do all things without murmuring and complaining, all right, that you may be blameless and harmless, that you may be the sons of God without any bad name in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Mm. You're the light. You're the light. Lord, help me to be the light. So then, you know what he did? He closed off this 10th part, the uh, fifth chapter, they broke it down into chapters, by telling some things that you do that really make your light shine. When you do these things, people really know that you're saved. All right? He said, what do you do? Well, in verse number, verse number 22, he said, uh, don't be angry without a cause. He said, if you do that, you're in danger of the judgment. Don't, don't call other people around you a fool. Don't curse people out. You'll be in danger of hell fire. If you're going to let your light shine, you can't go around being angry all the time and cursing people out. Verse number 23, he said, if you get ready to worship and you know that somebody's mad at you, leave your worship and go straighten that thing out. The Lord said, if you're going to shine, your relationships have to work. If my relationships don't work, I'm not shining, and it doesn't matter how much I clap my hands and speak in tongues. If, if I'm going to, he, he's talking about being a light, being a city on a hill. He said, this is the stuff you have to do. He said, you, you can't, you can't uh, go to court with everybody and be going to the law all the time. He said, agree with your adversary quickly. Let them have their way before you even get to court. 
Just say, well, Lord, never mind. You know, you think I did you wrong. I'll pay you some more money. Uh, you know, yeah, you can have this car. He says that in verse number 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way, lest you end up in court and it becomes a big mess. Just let it go, says Jesus. Now, we don't like to hear that kind of, we, I don't want my rights. They did me wrong. I don't care. I asked them to do different. They wouldn't do it. I'm going to court and I'm going to let the judge do this. And Jesus said, you do that stuff, but if you do that, your light's not shining. There's no light in that. He said in verse number 27, you want to let your light shine? Don't even lust in your heart after people of the opposite sex, and certainly not the same sex. All right? He said, don't even look at a woman with love. Not only are you not to lay your hand on her, don't even look at her like that, says Jesus. Don't even let your mind go there. That's how your light shines. Mm. In the world, they're just lusting after everything they can get their mind on. But Jesus said, if you're going to shine, you know, you've got to be different. He said, if you're going to shine, you can't, you can't use marriages as if they're disposable in the world that we now live in, mm. when they'll be married for six months, married for two or three years. And, and nowadays, folks, can I just say, if a marriage lasts five years, in these days, people think that's a big deal. That's really something. You've been married 10 years? Oh my goodness, how in the world did you do that? You know, but Jesus said, you know, you don't divorce unless, unless that other person gets deep into sin and leaves you. And all that, he said, then you can divorce. But otherwise, he said, you stay right there and show faithfulness. These are things that are kind of uncomfortable huh? because sometimes these relationships can get difficult. But if you're going to let your light shine, your marriage is going to have to look different from the marriage in the world. Your behavior is going to have to look different from the behavior in the world. You've got to love those that, that you've got to uh, bless those that curse you. Oh, Lord. This is hard to let my light shine that shine that bright, all right. And 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 uh, you know if, if they hit me on one cheek, you mean I've got to turn the other cheek and let them hit me again? Mm. That now, Lord, that's that's a lot of trouble. I don't know if I can shine like that. Seems like to me if they hit me on the cheek, then I got a right to hit them back harder and put fear in them. Jesus said, well, you know, he closes this by saying, if you do these things, you'll be the children of your father in heaven because he makes his son shine on the just as well as the unjust. He's good to people that, you know, what does it say? Love your enemies. All right. Bless people that curse you. Mm. Do good to people that hate you. Pray for people that are trying to undermine you and persecute you. And in verse number 45, when you do that, you're the children of your father, which is in heaven, because he makes he, he is good to, to evil people all the time. People sin and he lets their heart keep right on beating. People lie and cuss and he lets their lungs keep right on working. People do all these terrible things and he is good to, uh, to, to the, the evil and to the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so... Bishop Marty, can you give us some summary uh, perspective on this challenging identity that God has given us? Are we lights? We're lights. Okay. We're lights. And what does a light do? It makes things it makes things illuminate so that you can see them. See something, that's right. And we are to see, or the world is to see Jesus in us. Yeah. And the only way we can do that is by the life that we live and the character that we manifest, the dress code and the behaviors that Wait, so, emanate so, from so us. So there's a way that saints really should dress? I do believe there is. I think Paul wrote to Timothy about modest apparel and modesty and... So it even goes that far. It goes that far. And let me give you an example of me. Let me just tell you. Last week I traveled to Colorado. And I have to tell you, as, all, as I travel with Apostle Alexander, I do not know why, but TSA always bothers me. Just They just invariably bother me. Yeah, they do. They're going to just bother me. They're going to stop me. They just want to pat me down. They want to go through my luggage. They want to throw stuff out. They always. want to just ask me stupid questions. Yeah. And... I have developed an attitude. So last Monday, I had to leave early, early, early in the morning, four in the morning. I got less than three hours sleep. I was extremely tired. And as usual, I get up to the security point and TSA is bothering me. 
and I developed an attitude. And what I didn't say anything that was out of line, mm -hmm. but I sort of manifested an attitude in the way I looked. Frustration and anger? Ah, yeah. Okay. And so I, I go through the screening process and as usual, it's just the whole thing all yep. the time. Yep. So I walked to the gate and I sat down and I began to consider my behavior and I felt really bad. Convicted Not only religious. that, I was wearing a cross yep. around my neck. Yep. And I thought to myself, what kind of an image? What what am I really saying? Am I have I been a representative for the Lord? Have I done what I was supposed to do? Couldn't I have been nicer? Couldn't no, it doesn't matter that I was tired, didn't feel good. I have to at all times radiate the love of to. the Lord. We have to. He is my Lord and yeah. Master. Yeah. yeah. My life doesn't belong to me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have the privilege to fling luggage around and 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 roll my eyes at people. Yeah. That's what the world does. Now that's not what I was doing, but I'm just giving you sure. an example. I'm and I have to tell you, <laughs> I have to tell you, I repented. Yeah. I felt bad. I actually texted my husband. I said, "Now you're my spiritual leader, and I want you to know that I need prayer for this, and I'm confessing that I did not radiate the love of God." Yeah as much as I should or could have. And in every aspect of your life, you can you can drive your car out of your driveway and somebody's going down the street and you feel like you wanna have a finger gesture or you wanna you wanna say something or yell out the window. Sure. I mean this kind of stuff goes on all the time and you have to look at your life and measure it according to the word of God. Where have you fallen short? Where have you not manifested the grace of God, his goodness toward me. I have no right to have an attitude. I have no right to manifest honoriness and irritability. Correct. And I felt really bad before the Lord and repented. So on the way back, I prayed really hard coming from Denver back into Ontario and we did pretty good. Uh, you Even know, though TSA still bothered me. Right, but you had the grace of God. And in that tense moment, you permitted your light to shine so they could see your good works. We have the capacity to do it, saints of God. The Holy Spirit has given us the self-control uh, to uh, live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what Paul tells Titus. The grace of God that uh, has appeared to all men, uh, that covers all men, has appeared to us, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The unsaved people around us really need to see they need the light see. of God and the, the wisdom and the beauty of the kingdom of God. And if, uh, God forbid, if we as a people of God fail to show that kind of kindness and that kind of godliness, then where are they going to look to see the glory of God manifested? All right. There's an old cliche that we've all heard that uh, you're the only Bible that some will ever read. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been saying that all my life. You're the only Bible to some people. There's some people, they're never going to pick up this book. They just, they've not been taught it and they disappear it and they're not interested. But they can see Jesus shining out of us. And so that's the message tonight. Let your light so shine uh, day to day. Now, I know you can do that. If, if there's been any conviction, it's certainly not me condemning you. But if the Holy Ghost uh, has shown any of you an area where you can can please God better and represent the kingdom more. I want to summarize by saying God uh, met with those Jews on the on the mountain, his first major sermon, and he expressed to them, I want you all to know who you are. You're a chosen people. I, I separated you out of all the world mm. to be mine. And I held you up and put you where people could see you so that they could learn by watching you something about God, something about wisdom, something about righteousness. And the early church did that. The early church, they lived such godly lives that it wasn't long until slavery was outlawed in the Roman Empire and it was against the law to kill uh, to kill your, your wife anymore. Before that, you could kill your wife and just take another wife or whatever. And then they even outlawed, listen to this, they even outlawed crucifixion up a couple hundred years 
uh, and, and the church kept telling the story of how Jesus was crucified and the Roman Empire stopped crucifying people because the church mm. was a light and it, it showed culture. They closed the temple of Diana. They stopped all that sexual worship and turned all those pagan temples into Christian churches and the church shined brightly. And here we are today, mm. almost 2,000 years later, because the early church knew how to let the light shine. Right. So you can do that. We're praying for you. We're going to pray that you don't be discouraged by anything that was said tonight. Now, it wasn't a, it wasn't a combative, but it was um, uh, just kind of exhortational to tell us to saints, come on up. Let's be what God uh, has called us to be. And let's be what the world needs us to be. All right, let's pray. I want to pray for you now. Receive this, uh, the blessing of this prayer. Father, we thank you because we are the light. You called us to live in a way that is noticeable, that draws the attention of the unsaved, that causes others to see a wisdom and a beauty in the words that we use, the attitudes that we exude, the actions that we take, the patience and kindness and love and sacrifice and unselfishness and the maturity and the courage and the honesty that we show all of these things Lord, they shine the light of God into the life of the world round about us. So, Lord, bless us that we will shine as a shining light in a dark, dark world. The world's getting darker and darker. But, Lord, we know the principle that the darker it gets, the more impact the light will make. And so we thank you. Let this lesson go with us as this lesson is over tonight and the days ahead. Let it resonate. Keep bringing it back to us that we may remember uh, what it is that you're wanting from us. Empower us to be that shining light in a dark world. We thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're not saved, young man, young lady, somebody watching, if you haven't taken advantage of God's great opportunity to start over, you can be born again. You can get rid of all the dark stuff and all the bad stuff and just get it wiped off your record and get a fresh new start from tonight. You can be born again. You can be forgiven and empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's three things that we espouse. Repent. Think differently. Be baptized for the washing away of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if any man be in Christ Jesus, he or she is a brand new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. So if you're not saved, contact us, please. This is the altar call. We want to baptize you. We want to pray with you. And we want to lay hands on you and watch God fill you with his Holy Spirit. So please contact us uh, for that. Well, now we're at the end of our Bible study. God bless you. Here are our announcements for the week. Remember, we're meeting on Sundays at 1 p.m., 1 in the afternoon, from 1 till about 2.30. Our address is 9592 7th Street in the city of Rancho Cucamonga. So please share. Everybody bring someone with you. After service on this Sunday, we're going to bless our dear sister Christina Hunter, uh, with a baby shower. It is at my home, at the home of Bishop Marty Alexander, at uh, one at uh, 3 p.m. We get out of service about 2.30 and about three o'clock. We'd love to have you meet us there, bringing gift cards, bringing gift cards to our dear uh, sister Christina to be a blessing to her and to the family. Now, remember to continue to be faithful in your tithing. You've been doing an excellent job. And also, please give a, uh, an offering that honors the Lord, lets him know how much you appreciate him. Bring someone with you. We're moving toward the Easter season in just a few weeks now. So let's come together and let's really enjoy the house of the Lord. There's plenty of room for everybody. There's uh, lots of room for the children. Uh, we can be safe there, plenty of parking. And so as you come together with us on Sunday at 1 p.m., uh, the Lord is certainly going to be among his people. Well, God bless you again. Continue to like and share and also to chat as you are part of Bible study. And we love you so much. We'll see you on Sunday. God bless.